Hello viewers and listeners, today we are talking with Dr. Robert Cousin about the revolution in the treatment of obesity and type 2 diabetes. Dr. Cousin is a board certified plastic surgeon, medical researcher, entrepreneur, CEO and founder of the Biosculture Technology Inc. Uh, his personal goal is to guide and participate in the success of companies embarking upon worthy and promising projects for profit and society. Concentrating on the medical and uh, healthcare sectors to make favorable impact in these sectors. Beyond what he does with his own two hands as a plastic surgeon on a patient by patient basis. The link on the Bioscouch Technology Company website will be below the video. And now my conversation with Dr. Robert Cousin. Hello, hello, Robert. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Uh, Robert, wow, uh, license of early patent of your mentor, Eticon, uh, literally created the power assistant uh, liposuction market. Robert, why uh, you founded Biosculpture Technology and what differentiates its instruments? Good question. Uh, the first device, the first patent, may reduce the strength the surgeon has to use to put push a cannula through the tissue when they are you know doing liposuction but the surgeon still had to push the tissue the the cannula through the tissue multiple times roughly mm -hmm. 10,000 times an hour so that's a lot of the drudgery of surgery i wanted to remove that drudgery so i took it one step further if you have a tip of a uh, uh, a knife or a blade and it's vibrating it becomes effectively sharper that's why it moves through the tissue easily but what you, you really want is the surgeon not to have to move the tube back and forth you want them just to be able to put it somewhere take out the tissue without having to stroke it thousands of times you know uh, a minute but only have to position it in the exact place. And the way you can do that is you take the tube that's got the hole attached to a vacuum, which aspirates it, and you put it inside a sheath. And you align that sheath with the hole. And the net effect is that then that inner tube can be moved back and forth mechanically while the surgeon just positions it. So you've really removed the drudgery of the procedure. And you've created a very much more uh, more versatile aspiration system that can work with many other applications besides just liposuction. You know, and you can bend the outer tube. The human body is curved. So you can actually bend the outer tube and use the inner tube as either nitinol, a memory metal, or plastic. And that way you can literally get around the back of a leg, the back of a, you know, the back of the body and the flanks without repositioning a patient. And that, that's very effective. I mean, it's a perfect device for uh, gynecology, say, for a, a womb. It's a perfect device for uh, uh, getting around the back of the thigh. Uh, it, it's very, and it's very much labor saving because that's the real labor of the procedure. Yes, it's nice if you can push it through the tissue with less resistance. But how about if you don't have to push it through the tissue at all? So that was uh, the technology, those advanced patents that I set up Biosculpture Technology. And now taking it to the next level, uh, rather than making a wand-like device, which is what all liposuction instruments are, how about making it a pistol device and making it with very small, fine cannulas that are designed just for endoscopy. And that's the level we're on right now, the third generation, that rather than being a, a pneumatic device that takes tanks of air or a compressor, here you can just plug it into the wall as, as an electric device, very much more convenient because the younger surgeons much prefer electric as opposed to the older surgeons like me who had gas you know, in their offices. And, and here it's designed to go through a trocar, basically poke holes, keyholes, that you can actually do something in the abdomen. And because it doesn't have to be stroked, 
but just positioned, it actually is suitable for an endoscopy instrument which the, uh, you know, any of the other devices which need to be stroked, any of them, all of them need mm -hmm. to be stroked other than us. So it's, it really is kind of, it's the latest generation, basically the best and the greatest and the most labor saving and the safest. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, uh, Robert, uh, could you tell me about your revolutionary device uh, that your company is working uh, on? for the treatment of obesity and type 2 diabetes. Yes, the pistol device I just described, which uh, we call the EVL device, short mm -hmm. for endoscopic visceral apectomy, was designed to remove visceral fat. Visceral fat is the fat which kills you. It's the fat inside your abdomen. By bulk, it causes GERD and gastric mm -hmm. reflux uh, and sleep apnea simply by being there because it's bulky and it basically occupies space inside the inside the abdomen that makes your diaphragm go up higher but that fat also secretes a whole bunch of bad cellular hormones cytokines which cause a lot of problems including the uh, you know the cytokine storm with covid that we, we're having right now but most importantly resistin which causes type 2 diabetes Angiotensin, which causes hypertension, the interleukins and tumor necrosis factor, all of which irritate the blood vessels in combination with the, the bad lipid profile that the, 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 vis, that the uh, visceral fat causes. So it basically kills you and shortens your life. It's just bad stuff. And we can take it out. We can take it out safely. On the Biosculpture Tech uh, website, there's a, a picture uh, of removing fat with the twin cannula device, and you see all the tiny little twigs of blood vessels persist. Uh, none of them are disrupted. In the mesentery of the, the small bowel, there are fairly substantially sized uh, vessels with good media, which don't really have the slightest chance of being damaged by this device because it has no sharp edges. The, the edges of the cannula are filleted. Uh, they're blunt. And, you, and, and if you actually caught something in it, the device stops because the only movement, uh, the, the method of, of movement is just magnetic. There's no direct comment. There's no gear there. So if, if something is, gets in there like a finger or bowel, it just simply stops because it magnetically decouples. Uh, so when you remove that fat, what happens is two things. First of all, it doesn't grow back. Fat doesn't grow back anywhere it's removed, and that's kind of to the chagrin of a plastic surgeon if he's taken out too much in an area and you get a divot, because if, even if the patient gains a lot of weight after that, the divot's still going to stay there because there are no fat cells to, to get there. So that means that it, once you take out the visceral fat, the patient is that much healthier. Uh, that's pretty exciting. Because we, mm -hmm. we finally can do something that we couldn't do before. Mm -hmm. uh, Robert, uh, how is uh, different liposuction instruments and uh, how is uh, visceral uh, lipotomy different from current uh, bariatric uh, surgical approach to obesity and uh, type 2 diabetes? Okay, let's differentiate. Uh, visceral lipectomy from liposuction first, you know, first. Liposuction mm -hmm. is subcutaneous. It removes the fat that you can pinch between your fingers. That's it. If you can mm -hmm. pinch it between your fingers, we can take it out with liposuction. But after you pinch your belly between your fingers and your fingers basically stop because they hit, you know, something beneath there that's solid, that's, that's basically your abdominal wall. That's the external oblique fascia. You have to go inside the abdomen to deal with visceral fat. It's intra-abdominal. So that's the first thing to recognize that we're basically talking about a different 
area of the anatomy from subcutaneous we're going to intra-abdominal and we're basically we've left the realm of liposuction which is the realm of dermatologists and plastic surgeons and general surgeons or gynecologists who are operate who are doing liposuction here we're talking about an intra-abdominal procedure done by a general surgeon who specializes in bariatric surgery and who is who is certified in endoscopic procedures so it's a different surgeon performing it firstly then we're talking about fat in a different location and fat with a different function. It, it, when you talk about fat, it's really location, location, location. The intra-abdominal fat drains into the portal circulation. That means it drains into the liver. That means it can do those, those chemicals do different things. They basically hijack the liver. The liver is the protein factory of your body. And when it gets hijacked by visceral fat because of those cellular hormones, it basically generates bad fats, you know, fats that fill the enema of your blood vessels and, and give you strokes and heart attacks. Uh, a very clever Chinese fellow wrote, wrote, wrote a paper in which he proved that you could literally just measure with an ultrasound. He could sit next to you in a plane. And, you know, just using one of these $1,000 gadgets you can put on your Android or iPhone, uh, do a quick ultrasound of your abdomen, see how thick the, the leaflets of fat are, and tell you, hey, your intimate is pretty bad. You're likely to have a stroke within the next 10 years. And that's pretty impressive because if visceral fat can be shown to be that deleterious to your health, and it has been in all the literature, then obviously the target is to take it out. Now, what the current bariatric surgeries do is they starve it. And it sits there kind of like a squash sponge waiting for the first time you raid the refrigerator, you know, and give it some rocky road. And then what happens, because basically all the sweets you have are essentially just starch and sugar, you know, sh sugar and salt. The second that hits those sponges, they plump right up there, start putting out the tem terrible chemicals again. And that's why people who have dieted gain the weight so quickly back again. The current procedures... You, uh, the lap band, everybody comes back, you know, regains their weight fairly quickly. That that just, you know, essentially stops you from, from eating a lot at a single meal. The people adapt to it. If you can't have a Big Mac, you just go and have ice cream. Uh, and, and so the net effect is people just adapt to take in the same amount of calories and they gain their weight back. With the more... Uh, Intrusive procedures, such as a gastric sleeve, that's the most popular one now, the stomach is made smaller, generally permanently with staples, but you can also do it tempor temporarily with different kinds of uh, procedures that just make, make it smaller, uh, but require a foreign vice that electively you could remove later. Uh, or you can do a bypass. The bypass, you basically take the food, uh, it's coming out of the stomach, and you put it, you bypass a section of small bowel. And depending on how much small bowel you, you bypass, uh, that much food, more food, winds up in the toilet undigested. Now, the net effect of that is the patient has multiple bowel movements, winds up living in the bathroom with foul smelling diarrhea, and they're not very happy campers. And also, when you don't absorb a lot of food, you get B12 anemia, uh, your albumin goes down, which is basically the key protein your body puts out to, to make uh, muscle and tissue in your body. You have less of that, so you don't heal as well. So what, what the current procedures do, and those include the brand new ones, which are uh, uh, the balloons that you put into the stomach just uh, you know, through, through the nose and mouth. So it's basically just a, uh, an office procedure as opposed to a hospital or an outpatient ambulatory surgery procedure. They just uh, are space-occupying objects inside your stomach, which uh, make you get sated a little bit sooner. But the problem is when you take those devices out, what happens? Your stomach's dilated a little bit, and it's going to take that much more food to fill you. So there's no question you're going to gain the weight back. The only question is, are you going to gain back even more because it's going to take more food to fill you? So those current procedures simply starve the patient, starve the visceral fat. They don't eliminate it. We have now the only 
procedure for potentially eliminating that fat and doing it on a permanent basis without the necessity of actually doing a small bowel resection. Because obviously, if you take out a chunk of bowel, you take it, which is in a V, you're taking out a V, the you know the fat that's kind of in there. But that's not really what you want to do on patients because that's an anastomosis. It's a risky procedure, uh, fistulas and bleeding. Here, we basically can do it without cutting into the bowel, without leaving behind a foreign body, without creating a digestive cripple. And we can do it on a permanent basis. You know, At this point, we know it's going to work. Why? Because uh, omentectomy, that's, a, that's the apron of tissue that hangs down from your belly. If you remove that, the patient uh, does better than if you uh, do it with a lap band or a bypass alone. And that fat is less metabolically active than the small bowel fat. So, so we, we, we know that removing visceral fat in animals is super dramatic. But we haven't done it in humans before other than just the omentum. But we know that is effective. So we basically know it's going to work. We just don't know how well it's going to work. If it works as well as it does in the animals, I'll get a Nobel Prize. If it works less effective than that, the procedure will simply be repeated. It will be another procedure in the armamentarium of the bariatric surgeon, and our investors will get richer. Because the device, you know, you basically repeat the procedure and you, you need a, you know, a consumable for every one of those procedures. And basically you sell more razor blades. Wow. Uh, Robert, uh, EVL goals uh, after the deep fat uh, within abdomen. Uh, uh, am I right? <laughs> yes, correct. Yeah, we go after the deep fat inside the abdomen with this device. This is this is made precisely for you know endoscopy. And what's cool about endoscopy is when you do the procedure, you make some space by blowing the the, the abdomen up with 40 psi, you know, worth of nitrogen. Now that that's really cool because it does something nice. It means you literally have air pressure forcing the fat into the cannula that makes mm -hmm. the cannula more mechanically efficient and you can do two things with that first of all you can make it smaller and second of all you can aspirate more gently if you want the cells to live because if if you're aspirating under high volume you're going to disrupt some of the cells you know simply because of that high vacuum but if you want those cells to live because you want to do something with them, you can suck out with a lower with a lower vacuum, and and that really improves the uh, the viability uh, of any you know autograph that you're taking out uh, from the fat that you want. So it's very cool. Thinner cannulas, uh, more mechanical efficiency, greater viability. Mm -hmm. So uh, adipose cells. Uh go uh, through cannula of your device and uh, will they destroy it or no? Well, they, these will definitely be more gentle than a, any other means of doing it. Uh, anytime you, you, know, you do put anything through your cannula and you're moving it and you're harvesting, of course you're going to lose some cells. But the bottom mm -hmm. line is fat is a 50 times, 50 times better source of uh, stem cells than bone marrow. So part particularly when you can use a more gentle device that's far more controlled. I mean, the EVL device has a stroke of about an inch and a quarter. So it's, it's, it's not rough on the tissue. The edges of the cannula are smooth. And you can use it with a much lower vacuum when you want to take fat out for harvesting. And we have different kinds of collection devices which allow that fat to pre-fill the syringe without ever being touched by a human. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, that it literally can drain the extra serum and any blood that's with it uh, right out as it fills the syringe. And, and it's ideal for fat autografting. You mm -hmm. know, for the Brazilian butt lift for one, which is, you know, super popular, uh, you know, down in Florida right now. So will you be able uh, uh, fat you remove uh, to use for autografting? Absolutely. And the, 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 the autographs that are very common in the United States right now are the fat autographs. You know, you basically uh, – the FDA 
is very quick as a medical device to approve things which take fat out, put it in within one day, put it in the same place uh, that you got it out of. So basically, if you're doing subcutaneous fat and you're putting it into somebody's buttock, that's one. That is one of the most popular procedures, you know, in in any of the sunny states in the United States today. So that's obviously it's a given. What gets more exciting is if you lose the fact that if you employ the facts that you're taking out stem cells and stem cells are pluripotential. That basically means that stem cell can make a chondrocyte, you know, for cartilage in your knee. It can make a, car a cardiomyocyte for your ischemic heart disease. Uh, mm -hmm. And perhaps it can make a, a, a cell, you know, that can replace some of the damage in Parkinson's disease. Now, those are the studies that are being done. And since the, uh, there are basically 32 different types of uh, uh, stem cell lines which have been grown, most of that research is actually not being done in the United States. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, there's an anti-aging study that's being done in, 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 in the Caribbean. The, the ischemic heart studies I know have been done in Asia. Uh, the FDA is fairly stringent with that. But the bottom line is I've spoken to MTF, uh, Muscular Skeletal Tissue Foundation, and they can grow any, li any single line that you want from it. You know, it's just finding a site where it's approved for you to do the research. Because, as I said, the United States is a little bit uh, behind the times with allowing people to do those those trials. And obviously, any of those new trials have to be done with an institutional review, review board under under controlled circumstances. Because although we think the cells will do what we want it to, you know, there's no guarantee. You know, it, this is research after all. Mm -hmm. uh, Robert. Uh... How long does uh, uh, effect uh, last after surgery? Well, that's the beauty. It's permanent. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what we expect is that a patient will reach a plan. If we take out a, a, an outpatient amount, an outpatient amount is basically about four liters or 8.8 .8 pounds. So if we take out about four liters of visceral fat. Uh, because most of the states restrict outpatient, you know, fat removal, you know, between four and five liters, depending on the state. In Florida, you can basically take out 4.5 liters, but four liters of fat. Uh, so New York was four and a half. So basically, if you want to keep it, that's if you want to keep it as an outpatient, as opposed to putting the patient into the hospital and keeping them overnight for fluid replacement. So uh, that four liter, 8.8 .8 pounds. We expect the, the patient to lose a multiple of that, and that multiple being seven to ten times, because that's what we observe you know, in rats, dogs, and cats, uh, that and baboons that had that procedure. Uh, if it's less than that, you know, let's say it's three or four, you're still doing pretty good. You know, bottom line, you lose 40 or 50 pounds with an operation, the patient's going to come back. You know, obviously is. That is more than just a couple of inches on a waistline, and they're going to be quite happy, and you have impacted favorably on their health. And it will basically go down to a plateau. And then you can repeat the procedure to go down to a lower plateau, all the way till you get the patient down to an ideal weight. Why? Because you're just taking out some fat from the small bowel. You know, you're not doing anything drastic. You're not, you know, you, you, you're not cutting bowel. You're not putting a band around the esophagus. You're not bypassing and rearranging the alimentary plumbing, and you just pick a slightly different place in the small uh, the small bowel mesentery which you didn't touch before, and you thin that out. You got a, you got 20 feet of small bowel, so you basically have a, a large triangle of tissue that you you can thin out to improve the patient's health as much as you have to. Robert, uh, how safety will be endoscopic visceral lipotomy? Well, we expect it to be very safe for the two reasons. One is it's the tube within a tube that doesn't have to be stroked. And we've basically been using suckers inside the abdomen, you know, different kinds of aspiration tubes, sump drains or straight tubes for 70 years. I mean, there's nothing new about that. What's new about this device and unique is that it's particularly designed for fat, it, you know, the model that we're using. And, and it is designed 
ex, you know, just to go into the mesentery and remove that fat. I mean, you could actually put it in a gallbladder and uh, it, it's not made to remove, uh, you know, gallstones because it's basically not rough enough. But you could have a version that was rough enough to actually remove gallstones if you, if you wanted to do it. But it's it's safe. First of all, it's magnetically coupled. So if something went in there, it went into the space between the inner tube and the, the sheath by accident, it would just magnetically decouple. It wouldn't do it. I mean, you could just put your finger there and it'll stop. You wouldn't even pinch you. That's one thing. The second is the tube within a, a tube design altogether, which precludes you having to stroke it. So you just position it. You only have to concentrate on one thing. You put it there. You don't have to worry that it's when you move the the, the tube, it can rupture a spleen or a liver. Uh, that's not going to happen unless you're an absolute clod and position it inside a liver or a stroke because the device is not going to do it on its own. And the third, uh, the third reason is, is safe is because uh, to to reiterate once again, you're not cutting into the bowel. You, mm-hmm. you, you're not you, you're not making the stomach smaller. You're not putting a band around around the esophagus, and you're not you know taking ta- taking the small bowel and bypassing part of that. None of those things, all of which expose the patients to a, a host of potential complications and sequelae. Sequelae being things that really happen because they're expected to happen by nature of the procedure. I.e., you know, you're doing a bypass or you're doing a a stomach uh, stapling procedure, and you're getting malabsorption. Well, that just happens to be, that's really why the procedure works in the first place. You make the person malabsorb some of the food they're eating. That is that is actually, it's not a side effect. That is the effect of the operation. And here we're going for a different effect. The effect is, hey, let's reduce the fat that's secreting bad chemicals into the into the liver and the bloodstream. And we're getting rid of that fat on a permanent basis. To me, that makes a whole lot more sense. I mean, maybe someday our grandkids will be able to take a nose spray with some kind of RNA transferase in it that just makes all of our white fat into brown fat, which makes us, you know, makes our fat thermogenic. The net effect is, you know, our fat would burn more calories than it burns right now. Well, maybe our kids will get that, but it's not going to happen in your and my, you know, in our lifetime. Uh, Roberto, why it wasn't possible to cure visceral obesity before now? You had to do a small bowel resection. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you basically had to do a procedure that was harmful to the patient's general health. Uh, that was the only way to do it. Um, you could cut out the omentum. With the apron of tissue that hangs down from the, uh, the 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 stomach, but that is not as metabolically active, and that's an operation. You basically have to ch- you know you have, have to cut it out. There are lots of small, a lot of little bleeding vessels that you have to clip each and every one of them. Put about twenty or thirty hemoclaps on, and then you have to make a tiny little incision by the belly to take that fat out. So it's you know a scopic procedure that still requires a three inch incision behind you know beneath your neck that is possible to have a hernia through. So it's, it's nice to be able to avoid that. Uh, Robert, uh, you already mentioned uh, that uh, fat doesn't grow back. Uh, but yeah, but what if uh, patients will uh, go on over it? That's a good question, because obviously some people eat just as the way of dealing with stress. Mm-hmm. And that's also very fortunate because if they gain the weight, they'll gain it back subcutaneously. They won't gain it back intra-abdominally because of that compartment, compartmentalization. I mean, only 10% of what they eat would basically be gained intra-abdominally. So basically, they gain fat that we can just do liposuction and remove, but not fat that's going to be harmful to their health. Mm-hmm. So that's the beautiful caveat. If they eat because that's how they deal with stress, okay, they'll keep the plastic surgeons busy, but they won't get type 2 diabetes. Uh, Robert, uh, how many people with obesity and type 2 diabetes in the world uh, do you believe suitable for your treatment? That's mind-blowing. There are 2.1 billion obese patients oh, about wow. the globe. And, and somewhere around 40% of them will get metabolic syndrome. 
Metabolic mm-hmm. syndrome is what gives you type 2 diabetes, the annoying GERD and sleep apnea. That's why, I mean, you can't put TV on now and not hear somebody talking about visceral fat and, and sleep apnea and how you clean your devices for sleep apnea. And the reason this is so so popular now and you know people you know advertise to the public directly on tv is because so many people are obese (laughs) Uh, uh, hispanics and blacks are 50 55 percent of their populations are obese 40 Mm percent of our general population is obese and that percentage is increasing each and every year one-third of our kids are obese Mm -hmm. that means one-third of our teen one-third of our teenage mothers Teenage uh, girls are going to be obese mothers, and what happens if the the mother is obese when they can conce- they conceive and give birth to that child? That child will be born with more visceral fat than the child born of a skinny mother. Mm-hmm. That basically means that child is destined to have type two diabetes before they're an adult. That is a, a, a horrible situation, and that's why our society is getting you know. Our lifespan is not increasing, which mm-hmm. it had been up until up until now. That's the reason it isn't. It's because of the 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 real epidemic is obesity, and obesity is what really is killing people with COVID. That's mm-hmm. that's the killer, because the the cytokine storm comes from that visceral fat. If you took away the obesity, uh, the morbidity among non-obese, even including the elderly. I mean, non obese is much less frightening than the the obesity than than the morbidity of COVID, you know, in the obese population. And the morbidity of obesity bad enough that shortens your life. I mean, it's the most frequent cause of blindness, the most frequent cause cause of uh, 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 kidney failure requiring dialysis. And of course, diabetes and amputations is the most frequent mm-hmm. cause of non-traumatic amputations. Yeah, visceral fat is a horrible, horrible thing, and metabolic syndrome is just a really life-shortening and quality of life-reducing disease uh, syndrome. Robert, uh, what's uh, the difference between uh, liposculpture and liposuction? Well, we usually refer to liposculpture when you you're really just uh, fine tuning the the body. You know, mm-hmm. when you when when you're doing some some liposculpture on the chin to remove a double chin, or you're sculpting abs to to simulate uh, you know the the nice uh, inscriptions that you have on somebody who has a really six pack or an eight pack abdomen. That we more refer to liposculpture. But when when you just you know bulk removing you know tissue you usually just call it liposuction. Mm-hmm. Uh, when, when when we're kind of, when we're adding tissue and doing a nice uh, pleasing butt with with uh, the Brazilian butt lift, you can call that liposculpture because basically we're adding fullness and roundness to it. So it's it's more referred to kind of like a, the fine tuning. Wow, uh, R- Robert. Tell me, please, about six uh, six pack, eight pack. Uh, <laughs> yeah, guys always love this. It very it originally started being very popular in L.A., but now it's popular around the, the the country. What you really do is, you know, once you have a flat abdomen to begin with, you know, whether it's with the aid of you know liposuction or not, you take it a step further. And you, you basically have before you before you do the procedure, you have the patient you know do a couple of sit ups on the table, and then you mm-hmm. can literally feel where their natural divisions are between the, the rectus muscles. You feel the rectus muscles on either side. You feel the division down the middle, and, and you feel the spaces between the muscles. I I mean I, I'm not the biggest person in the world, so I mean I have a six pack. I don't have a four pack. Uh, but the bottom line is we can help that out because if you go a little bit more aggressively in, in the area where you want the sculpting, you can ha- help the body get that nice contour of a six-pack. Uh, the patient can lose that if they gain a whole lot of weight after you've done the job. But 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 the bottom bottom line is you you get a you get a pretty nice contour. Then you really help the patient out to get a dramatic result. 
Uh, great. Uh, uh, Robert, uh, from what age allows to do liposuction surgery? We like, we like the patient to be grown up. I mean, so at least puberty, not before puberty. Because, uh, I mean, a lot of children are, are, are chubby. And you shouldn't be operating on, on, you know, chubby children who are just a little overweight. You should wait till, you know, puberty starts. They have their great, their growth spurs, spurt. They've got some hormones working, which kind of thins them out a little bit. And it's a more mature being. I mean, so it's like, sir, you know, sir, I don't like to do it before 16. I prefer not to do it before 18. But it depends on the patient. Mm -hmm. uh, Robert, uh is it possible to give uh, BIOS after abdominal liposuction? And can uh, liposuction be done to women who haven't uh, given BIOS yet? Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you can do liposuction on, on anybody, you know, whether somebody's given birth or not. That's not a problem. You're obviously not going to operate on a pregnant woman. Mm -hmm. uh, we always do a pregnancy test before we operate to make sure they aren't pregnant because those people should not be put to sleep. Uh, but the bottom line is, yes, you you can do it before and then you can give childbirth because this is not an intra-abdominal procedure that's going to do anything to the womb or uterus, you know, or the abdominal wall. So the patient can, you know, just conceive, have a child and blow up the way, you know, a mother, you know, conventionally does. But the nice thing is afterwards, we can thin it out a little bit. And one of the most popular procedures today, of course, is, you know, now we're talking cosmesis, we're not talking about EVL, is the mommy makeover. I mean, the mommy makeover is either just liposuction of the abdomen or a, a little tummy tuck that may or may not, you know, depending on how big it has to be, depending on how uh, mm -hmm. the, the uh, abdomen is, uh, you know, got afterwards, that we just basically tighten that up, you know, with or without a breast lift. Mm -hmm. uh, Robert, uh, uh, can liposuction relieve gynecomastia in men? Absolutely. Uh, but you generally have to be, be a little bit more aggressive than just routine liposuction because routine liposuction doesn't cut. Yeah. And when you're talking about the tissue underneath the nipple, generally there, there's some glandular tissue, that, tissue there that you have to be a little bit more aggressive with. Now, you can do that with twin cannula uh, liposuction because that can be a little bit more aggressive if you crunch the tissue with your finger appropriately. You can do that with the vaser or any of the lasers that essentially melt the tissue. Or you can do it the old-fashioned way, which is basically cut it out. But the bottom line is the glandular tissue underneath the, the nipple has to be removed. Uh, but the bulk of the tissue, you know, the entire breast mound and generally going out to the tail, all of that can be very well done with liposuction through a tiny, tiny incision just at the at the junction of the areola, the pigmented part, which heals virtually invisibly. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, Robert, and, uh, we, we, women want to know, is it possible to have uh, liposuction surgery uh, and uh, uh, to use uh, their fat, to use their adipose tissues to increase uh, breast size or uh, make femur butt. Absolutely. I mean, that the I'd say for the last seven or eight years, it's been very popular to use. If, if you can get away, you can do a couple of things with the, the fat augments. First of all, it's from the patient themselves. It's their tissue. It's not going to be rejected. It's generally put in in the same setting that you're taking it out. Though you can't actually store it in the you know in the freezer for you know you know a year or two. But the bottom line is you you you, you like the tissue fresh, and mm -hmm. If, if you're not doing a very big breast augmentation, you can do it with fat alone. If you do it with an implant and the patient doesn't have much overlying tissue, it's nice to kind of do around the perimeter because it helps make the, the, the implant less detectable or undetectable. And for the butt, yeah, absolutely. Because the way uh, buttocks generally fail is the, the, the bulk of tissue winds up being lost at the top. Part of that is because the body, you know, resorbs that fat just because it has such a healthy blood supply. And the second is because, uh, you know, the buttock muscles kind of, you know, people aren't climbing stairs as much when they get older. Yeah. So those muscles go down a little bit. So if you fill that and you kind of do it in a, a pleasing triangle, 
you 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 get a you know you basically get a round butt again and extremely popular and the breast dog is very popular you know to kind of help that and when we do breast reconstructions for mastectomy using fat smooths it out a lot because the the the, the patient has lost underlying tissue and the flaps are thin so this way you can kind of thicken them up a little bit particularly around the perimetry where you need it mm -hmm. Uh, Robert, uh, could you tell us about opportunities to invest uh, in biosculpture technology and uh, how uh, someone can find out more? Sure. I mean, this really isn't you know, a place to kind of seek money, but the bo bottom line is the company is a private company and we have a private placement memorandum and anybody who's really interested uh, can, can contact me and but you know it's an investment and all investments carry risk and this is basically for accredited investors only and if they're interested you know call me and I'll let them know about it uh, bottom line on it is I've put 2.6 million of my own money in this I believe in it this is the way I want to give back to the world because Plastic surgery has just been really ridiculously good to me, you know. And, and uh, what, what's, what happened is I started doing surgery on patients who were overweight and frankly obese simply because I had an, an instrument which made it easy for me to do that. And as I saw that, I yeah, I saw that the patients, you know, had, with, had really visceral fat, because particularly a man, when you try to do the middle of a man. And he's got that beer belly. Well, you can take out the flanks and you can definitely make it better. But, you know, you're feeling muscle there and you can't go beyond the muscle. So you can only have a limited effect. And I, and I, I, I saw that it was the visceral fat inside that was causing the cosmetic defect. And I learned that besides the cosmetic defect, it was basically killing it. So at that point, I knew we have to go after it. And what was kind of an incidental thing, which is a funny story, is I was in the early days, we didn't use epinephrine in the solution. So there were, you, know, you basically lost a little bit of blood when you did liposuction. Now, very little because you use a, uh, you <laughs> swell up the tissue with fluid beforehand and there's epinephrine in it. So it's very, very little. But I had designed a bipolar cordery that would work with our device. And I was testing it on a pig. And I'm a city boy. I mean, so I didn't know that a 125-pound pig is just a pure hunk of muscle. There was no fat on the pig. So I, you know, I was $5,000 in the hole with an engineer I was paying, you know, at Memorial, um, at Howard Labs, Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York. And I had this pig intubated and asleep. And there was no fat. There was no subcutaneous fat. And it's like, what are you going to do? Well, I'm also a general surgeon, so I just opened the abdomen and I got the fat. I knew there'd always be the mesentery and some mesenteric fat. And I had this, uh, this, you know, this early device, which was a prototype Airbrush One, four-inch stroke, four-inch stroke, big stroke. And I was able to just, you know, use that to take out the, you know, omental and mesenteric fat without even turning the cautery on. And so that basically was just logged to me. First of all, the bipolar cordery worked very well. And second of all, hey, we can actually take out visceral fat. And then over the next, you know, six years, uh, we basically saw how evil visceral fat is. And, then, and I said, hey, let's design something just for that. Instead of a wand, let's make it, make it you know, an endoscopic instrument uh, that we can do this and, and treat patients that way. And that's kind of how we came to this. Robert, uh, what should people take away from our conversation and what's your message to people? Visceral fat is bad. Uh, I hope we will soon have a way to remove it. And recognize, I, I think one thing patients, should, uh, all, everybody should realize is when we grew up, we made fun of the fat kids. And, you know, they, we always thought they had no willpower. Well, that's baloney. What we, we all should realize is that somebody who's obese is chemically challenged. Once there's visceral fat, and that visceral fat is putting out relin and neuropeptide Y, which act directly on the brain to stimulate hunger, and it's putting out resistin, which prevents the sugar from going to the brain and to the muscle, that person who's eating 
is not eating because, you know, they want to. They're eating because basically the brain's being told to, the brain's not getting sugar, and they don't have the energy to work out. So you recognize that they are chemically challenged and basically have some mercy on them and some understanding and recognize that the kids who were born of an obese mother are having a, a, a disadvantage that we have to find a way to be able to cope with. And as I said, right now, I think this surgical procedure will be the best way. Perhaps down the, uh, the road, there are some 30 genes which control obesity. Perhaps down the road, we'll learn how to manipulate those genes more effectively. Uh, that we can prevent the teen from becoming the, you know, the, the, the obese mother w w simply, you know, with a pill or something. I mean, certainly Big Farm would love that. But the bottom line is I'm a surgeon. I think like a surgeon, if there's an anatomic problem that's, you know, if, they, if there's a lump that's causing a bad thing, I like to cut it out and remove it. And here we don't have to cut it out. We can basically just aspirate it out. And it sounds pretty cool to me. Robert, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Alex.